Hi, everyone, and welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break. I'm Lahiro. And I'm Stan. And today we've got a really interesting episode. I'm going to give a performance tip, but also Stan's going to go through some interesting statistics stuff. And so let's get started. And the obvious disclaimer, a lot of this is going to have some medical information, but it's just general medical information for education purposes. It's not advice. And definitely if you're treating a patient, use the resources of your treating team and your consultant supervisor before making decisions for patients. Now, you've got a performance tip for this week. And what is your performance tip? Yeah, look, so maybe I was thinking about a performance tip, but then you rightly said that, you know, just reflect on what's happened in the week. And, you know, the thing that's happened is I've actually got an injury uh, and that's actually been a decreased performance for me. And it, it's been really, it's been really tough because I, I just woke up with this incredible pain and I tried to go into work and it just had a tough, tough, really, really tough morning. Well, yeah, and, I, I suffered because of you. And, <laughs> yeah, uh... no, I'm, I am so sorry. <laughs> that's not going to, that's not going to the details. <laughs> <laughs> so for uh, all those who know, me, me and I work together in terms of at, at Western Health. Um, so unfortunately oh, uh I his misery you. is my misery but I yeah I, look, I, I did see you that morning and and you weren't right and so i think i i thought look this would be an important thing to sort of share with everyone in terms of how you manage that because i think a lot of trainees they'll at some point during their study they're going to go through yeah. some physical discomfort um mm. whilst they're trying to perform at a very high level so like yes. tell us like what what did you do I know other than get me to <laughs> do more work for you <laughs> <laughs> is it balanced out the fact that i do all the editing that, that's the balance right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all okay. right yes no fair yeah, fair, yeah fair. you got you got me on that one <laughs> uh so i don't even know if i'm doing I, I know that when i was going through training i didn't take care of myself very well at, at all because i think we all we all try to just put up with things and just keep going to work and whatever um but you know i think the more responsibility i have i realized that you know, you know it really it really just come down to me that I, I've got to be at full performance level to be doing a safe anesthetic anyway. So I, I don't know if this was the right approach, but I, you know, I, I, I took some time off and essentially sought medical, medical care. So I went to see a physio and an osteo in the same afternoon just to try and get uh, kind of a solution to this, to this problem. And um, so I think my method is I just try to t- take stock that I'm not going to be able to do everything I want to do, just accept it. And then just, you know, don't try to doctor myself and just go and, you know, find an expert who's going to tell me useful things and, and actually play the patient and just be okay with that. Yeah. Because I think that's from what I, everything I've heard from my mates and, you know, everyone else, no, no doctor wants to be a patient and we, we hate it well, with terrible patients. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. And even um, what you said at the start where you sort of questioned whether this was the right thing to do, mm. like, isn't that so interesting that even us as uh, professional mm. uh, health professionals that we even question whether looking after our own health is mm-hmm. the right thing is the right thing to do yeah. and i look i know and i know i joke about um having to sort of cover you but i th- think that is an important thing to recognize that we're all here look trying to look after one another and if you know if someone needs help um we're all we're all more than willing to um to jump in and, and lend a hand and mm-hmm. to um f- for you to actually get that opportunity to seek the help that you, um that you need to get better and yeah. i think everyone's willing to do that and i think you know it's just that just the idea of reaching out and being able to communicate and just telling people that that's a, <laughs> yeah. that's such a big thing. So it, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I just keep justifying my mind that if I don't sort, that, sort this out now, then it will be weeks and weeks and months and hopefully not years. And you don't want that to happen. You'd rather just nip this in the bun, just get it sorted. And then you're back, hopefully back to normal. Yeah. I think that's an important point to make is that if you do have any physical or mental ailment, Mm. Um, that you seek help and you seek help uh, quickly and efficiently. Yeah, it will be better for you in the long run. I, I, you know, I, that, that just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You don't let something become chronic. Yes. You, you just get it acutely and <laughs> hopefully that sorts it out. All right, let's go. Okay, Stan, yeah. So <laughs> let's uh, check this question out. So this is a question from, I think the 2020 paper. Yeah, 2020 exam, so recently. Oh, recently, okay. So Malin Patty score is a diagnostic test for difficult intubation with a sensitivity of 30% and specificity of 90%. Describe how this information and other statistics related to this test uh, can be used in predicting difficult intubation. How does the prevalence of difficult intubation affect the performance of the test? Wow, that's a mouthful. Yeah, that is a mouthful. And this is an 
This is the, luckily for the, all the primary candidates, this is the only statistics that you will need to know about. So that's really good that this is the only um, stats question that you get. I remember when we did the exam, we had to learn a whole a whole lot of other stats. Did you have to do that? Yeah, like uh, we had to know all one. the chi squared and Fisher's chi exact. Chi squared and Fisher's exact tests. So, so are you saying we don't have to do any of that now? No. So the only um, learning objective now for the primary exam mm. is this question on sensitivity and specificity. Wow. So and then um. Uh, this is an iteration of a question that has been previously asked in the past. And the thing to note with this question is that they have modified it uh, somewhat. So what's, what's changed about this question is that now they've given you some numbers with regards to what the sensitivity of uh, a melon party score is and what the specificity is. Mm -hmm. And the other important thing that they've changed is that the last, so the last question is how does the prevalence of difficult intubation affect the performance of this test? Oh, I love Whereas that. Whereas so in previous iterations, relevant. it was how, how does the incidence of difficult intubation affect the performance of this test? And I'm mm. going to be honest with you, that was what was confusing me with mm. the previous questions, that idea of incidence. Mm -mm. And we're going to talk about how it, how it fit, how it um, incorporated that into some of the as other aspects of the equation, such as Bayes' theorem, because mm. when we talk about statistics, there's the difference between incidence and prevalence. Mm. Um, so prevalence talks about, yeah, the amount or, or the quantity of um, a condition occurring over a period of time, yes, uh, or, or that's present um, in that period of time, whereas incidence talks about um, how what's the rate of um, that condition occurring. Okay. Yes. So like that's a yeah, so prevalence at, at, talks about at, at a point at a point in time. But... Yes. Uh, so incidence. So incidence talks about how um, uh, how someone can develop a condition yeah, mm -hmm. during a particular time period, whereas uh, prevalence talks about those who who had who currently has that condition. Yeah, and during uh, that time it, period for a difficult intubation, incidence almost feels like I could be wrong, but the wrong. You know, the wrong thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Which is why it was really confusing when they asked it in the previous iteration where they had the word incident. So they've actually corrected it uh, yeah. for the 2020 exam and they've used the right terminology because when someone's, when someone has a difficult intubation, they don't develop it. They oh. either have it or they yeah. don't. That's right. And generally, I mean, generally speaking, whatever they've got, you know, at the start of their adult life is what they've got, except for when they start developing things like obesity, ankylosing spondylitis, Yes. And so maybe you can get into, you know, or trauma. Yeah, maybe perhaps, yeah. And other things like uh, abscess, neck abscesses yeah. or um, tongue swelling, things that uh, could potentially make the airway difficult. But then it's almost vanishingly rare. So the incidence is so low that it would be less, um, oh, it would be such a, not, not a very useful indicator, but again. Well, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to discuss about that. And, and that's the idea of um, mm. uh, how, the incidence or the prevalence of a condition affects what happens afterwards in terms of um, the effect that it has on your pre-test odds to post-test yeah. odds. And we can discuss that with uh, um, the idea of uh, using a Bayes theorem and the idea of using uh, likelihood ratios. Sounds good. So, so let's, yeah. look at, let's look at your structure then. So how did you structure uh, this or what did the examiners talk, talk about this? Okay, so reading from the examiner's report um, to get a pass, you needed to have a two by two contingency table. So that's pretty simple enough to do. Mm -hmm. So the two by two contingency table, if we could just explain it, it has those with the disease on, on the top. Okay. And I think we can make a link uh, in that description. I think one of the challenges about the podcast is trying to describe this two by two contingency table, because I think in a Viva, you would naturally just draw it out, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, that's why we'll send it onto YouTube and I'll you know, up, upload yeah. these as a, as a little so, so those with the conditions or those or what you consider the gold standard, they would be on um, what are considered on the vertical on the vertical columns. Whereas the test that you're looking at, they're going to be on the horizontal columns. OK, yeah. so that that's how a two by two contingency table is set up. So on now, the, the other things that to, we need to, to clarify, just to clarify. So on the top, disease present, disease absent. And on the uh, side, positive and negative test. That's right. So disease present, disease absent is um, whether you know that patient has the disease or the gold standard, okay, of, of the test. And then, and those are on the vertical columns. And then 
on and then looking looking across where you've got positive or negative, that's the actual tests uh, that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. All right. And now the other things that the examiner wanted was definitions of sensitivity and specificity, um, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and then to also discuss the clinical relevance of melanin party scores on difficult intubation. In other words, what you were mentioning, that what the effect of low prevalence does. Now, additional marks could also be gained from discussion of Bayes' theorem, likelihood ratios, and receiver operating characteristic curves. That's already so, got pretty complicated, so. You know. Oh, tell you what, I tell you, it's, you know, the, the standard has definitely increased uh, since the last time uh, I did a model answer for this exam. Mm. Uh, you know, I think uh, my model answer didn't have anything, um, didn't have any of the rock curves and mm. um, maybe had minimal discussion on likelihood ratios. So you can see that uh, I think as time goes on, I think the standard just gets higher and higher and higher. And, you know, we, I think we, we are expecting our candidates to know more and more. We really should have just done this exam back in the 50s when actually you, <laughs> the, just yes, didn't right. do an, you didn't do an exam, you just became an anesthetist. <laughs> that's right. Yes. And then, and then after that, you, you are the ones that uh, set the exam or, or set the bar. Maybe that's the um, take home message. Start your own club. Don't. And then make your own exam to get into that club. <laughs> and, uh... That's right. <laughs> set the bar so high no one else can get in yeah yeah that's right exactly okay so i noticed um, that you've done in your in the method of you running these uh, so you do a literature review as well T tell me about that all right so so the literature review that i do when looking at these answers is um where where do i get the information from so there's nothing available from any of the prescribed texts that ansca has so i've i've uh, used two articles and, and we can link those articles uh, in the description. There's one from Australian prescriber and there's one from critical care. And, these, and this will form the basis of where um, our discussion will come from. Okay. So I guess uh, to like the start to any um, question, we, we, we need a framework. So we've got an idea of what the examiners expect. Well, let's go through systematically. So would you say definitions? What is sensitivity? Yeah, uh, and exactly. So I'd, I'd, have my, I'd, I'd have my two 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 contingency table drawn up. And once you draw that out, um, you can label the four um, the four squares. So people will lab label them differently. People can label them as A, B, C, or D, or they'll label them as true positive, uh, false positives, false negatives, and true negatives, mm -hmm. all right? Now, when we speak about it verbally, it's very hard to orientate yourself in terms of where those things fit into the square. Mm -hmm. So again, it's one of those things that, especially if you get asked in a viva, that it's it's easier to sort of um, draw it out on the um, on a piece of paper or on or on the uh, on the iPad. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, definitions of what sensitivity is. So, at its core, the sensitivity is is uh, described as the true positive rate. Now, if we would expand on what that means, it means that for those who have the disease, how many of those will test positive, all yeah. right? And another way of phrasing it, so there's multiple, there's different ways of phrasing it. So another way to phrase it is that it's the probability of a positive test in those who have the disease. Yeah. And you can see already why uh, statistics can be so confusing because yeah what we're doing is we're trying to translate that into an English language description. And mm. when we do that, um, you can see that there's multiple permutations of how you can describe it. And so, you know, I've, I've written up uh, a formula and you can rearrange the formula multiple different ways in terms of the way that you describe it. Mm. But when you actually look at the formula itself, so sensitivity is your true positives divided by your true positives plus your false negatives. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's, that, that can't change. That's mm -hmm. the formula. Yeah. All right. But the way that you can describe it, you can have different permutations. So you can, you can put the numerator, you can describe the numerator first uh, and, or you can describe the denominator first. Mm -hmm. And that's what, and that's why it's so confusing with when you talk about statistics. I mean, literally, I remember thinking if I can draw this table, that's the easiest way to get that's it right. because I'm not worrying too much about it. Definitely. I love it, this succinctness of your definition probability of positive test in those who have the disease. That makes a lot of sense. But if you can't remember that, at least you've got a table and you know that it's, you know, a over a plus C on that table. I'll show you the, the diagram for this on YouTube, but also send the link to it. That's and right. Yeah. Nice. Um, so again, as you can see, there's multiple ways that people think about this. And I think that that 
any look any way is correct in terms of how you want to think about this uh, and how it sort of fits clearly in your head but know that when we talk about sensitivity we're talking about those who have the disease so we're talking about the vertical columns okay so uh how about those who have the disease or those who don't who don't have the disease we're always talking about the vertical columns sounds good uh tell us about specificity specificity so specificity um is we're looking at the other vertical columns so it's it's called the true negative rate, mm -hmm. okay? So the description of that would be, for those who don't have the disease, how many of those will test negative? Yes. Or the other way that you can also describe it is, it's the probability of a negative test in those who, don't, who do not have the disease. Mm -hmm. And then the formula um, is false, you're, sorry, your true negatives divided by your false positives plus your true negatives. Yeah. Excellent. And, and as we're going through this, definitely encourage you guys to look at a two by two table of sensitivity, specificity, et cetera. Then you can kind of track along as you're listening. It's, it's so difficult. And look, I can imagine all those people listening on the podcast or maybe in their car. Um, <laughs> it's one of the hard things, isn't it, with the podcast, how you can verbally describe a, a graph or a table. And I think that's one of the challenges um, hmm. that, uh, that we have. It's, it's probably an advantage, like in terms of you, you're listening to the podcast, you've got to then go back to look at that four, uh, four by you know, two by two um, table, yeah, table, and then be able to reproduce it in your mind and think about it as, you, as you're listening. So it's, it's probably a good thing to practice as well. Yeah. Okay. So how about negative predictive value and positive predictive value? Okay. So when we talk about positive predictive value, we're looking at across. So we're looking at the horizontal columns now. Okay, we're looking at the tests. Mm -hmm. So positive predictive value is for those who have tested positive, how many of those will have the disease? Mm -hmm. Or you can also describe it as the probability of having the disease given a positive test. Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, now we're framing it in terms of the test itself. Sensitivity and specificity, you're framing it in terms of uh, the patient, but now we're framing it in terms of the test. So the, the formula for positive predictive value is your true positives divided by the, your true positives plus your false negatives. Oh, sorry, your, your true positives plus your false positives. Apologies about that. Yeah, so pretty much okay. just positives all over the shop. I know that, that this is why it's sort of so, so confused. Even, even when I think about it myself, I can get very, very sort of confused. And, um, <laughs> and as you said, the best way to sort of think about this is with a two by two uh, contingency table. Yeah. And, and again, just thinking strategically, the quickest way you can get this on paper is true positive over true positive plus false positive, or if you've drawn the table, A over A plus B. Yes. Get it out quickly. Correct. Correct. Um, so we're looking at, we're looking at the horizontal columns. Okay. Yeah. Negative predictive value. What do you reckon? So negative predictive value. We're looking at the, now the, the second horizontal, um, the, those horizontal columns and the negative predictive value is for those who have tested negative, how many of those will not have the disease mm -hmm. or it can also be described as the probability of not having the disease given a negative test. <laughs> and so the formula for that is your true negatives divided by your false negatives plus your true negatives. Or as you've uh, sort of described before in terms of uh, letters, so it's D over C plus D. Perfect. Um, and so this is not some, uh, um, you know, I think I've used the last four terms regularly, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative pred predictive value, but likelihood ratios is not something I've been using a lot. Tell us Yes. That. So likelihood ratios, is related to both the sensitivity and the specificity of the test. And likelihood ratios describes the change, and this is this is really important, it describes the change in odds mm. of a patient having the disease given an outcome, mm -hmm. all right? Now, this is very important because um, the way that sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value can be described is they can be described as probability. Mm -hmm. So positive predictive value describes the probability of a patient having the, the disease given a positive test. Whereas I, I, so just to reiterate, likelihood ratio describes the change in odds of a patient having the disease. 
given an outcome. So what that means is that you can have a positive likelihood ratio or you can have a negative likelihood ratio. It, it sounds right. like you need a, a given an outcome. So it's kind of referring to the ba- um, like the probability theory where you, if, if this, then that. Uh, so you need some kind of precursor outcome for you to apply the likelihood yes, ratio. Yes, that's is right. That- so the, the way that likelihood, and that's why we're sort of building these concepts and the way that likelihood ratio fits into this discussion is through Bayes' theorem, which we'll discuss on uh, for after we discuss likelihood ratio. Because likelihood ratio, the thing about likelihood ratio is that it's independent of prevalence, mm-hmm. okay? And that's really important to sort of understand. And again, it just describes the change in odds. And for those who are wondering what's the difference between odds and probability. So the way to think about that is how you change, um, how you change a probability to odds. And the way to do that is if you think about the idea of what the, what the probability of something happening is, you need to, a likelihood ratio will compare that to the probability of something not happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, if that makes sense. In other words, what it does is the odds of something happening needs to be divided by one minus those odds or the odds of not, of having not that happen. And that will give you the likelihood ratio or the odds. Yeah, okay. And and that's that's different from probability. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think the best the best thing is to like obviously this is such a great example because Mal and Patty is something we do every day. Let's let's go straight to. Uh, well, 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 let, 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 oh. well, let's have a think about this. Okay, so let's say I've got um, okay. Let's say the probability of, uh, let's say a a disease is twenty five percent. Make it nice and easy. Twenty five percent. So um, mm. we've got we've got the prevalence of twenty five percent. Now, what's the odds of you, of you having that that disease? To be like one in four. Yeah, exactly. So not not one in four. It's actually one in one in three. I know odds is a little bit different. I know, I know, it's a little (laughs) bit different. So remember that it's so so the probability is twenty five percent, and one minus twenty five percent is seventy five. So when you got twenty five divided by seventy five, it's one in three. Remember remember odds are different. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it, uh, okay, so I know it's okay. So I'm not a, I'm not a gambler, but for those who do are interested in sports betting or horse racing, um, that's where that's where that um, that's where the odds come from, mm-hmm. and that's why it's it can be a little bit confusing when you try to translate that to um, the actual numbers in terms of what you're actually betting. So how mm-hmm. they describe odds and how they describe probability mm-hmm. is they're, they're related, but the way that they're described can be a little bit different. Okay. Yeah. Now, what I'm going to um, sort of talk about next is the likelihood ratio. And I think let's just keep it in terms of, um, let's just keep it in terms of positive likelihood ratio. So positive likelihood ratio just describes the change in odds of a patient having the disease given a positive test. Mm-hmm. So in other words, um, let's say that a, let's say you're, you're examining a patient and they've got a melon party score of four. Mm-hmm. So what's the likelihood ratio and how does that change um, their, their pre-test odds to their post-test odds, okay? Yeah. And the way to define the, the likelihood, the positive likelihood ratio, it's the true positive rate divided by your false positive rate, all right? So in other words, it's sensitivity divided by one minus specificity. So in this, in this example here where you have a sensitivity of um, what we what did the what did the exam have um, sensitivity of thirty percent and a specificity of a ninety percent. What that means is that your positive likelihood ratio is going to be three. All right, you're three times more likely. Three times three times more likely compared to what your pretest odds were. Now. This is this is where this is where the other confusion comes in, because if you're if the incidence of um, prevalence if, uh, sorry if the prevalence of a disease is twenty five percent and your likelihood ratio is three, mm. it doesn't increase your percentage three times. So you don't go from twenty five to seventy five percent. And this is what I was talking about before: is that likelihood ratio? Um, it changes your odds. Mm-hmm. It doesn't 
change the actual percentage of um, of 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 your pretest or your risk. Okay, and then what you do is after you change your odds, then you change that back to probability. And this is where you know you get that um, that Bayes normogram. Have you seen that? Have you seen that normogram before? I don't think I have. So uh, you know, I remember this normogram in in uh, in in uni days. It's that little table where they ask you to draw a line between your pretest probability, your likelihood ratio, and then it'll give you a um, what your post test probability was. Post test probability. And where I was always confused was I was going, isn't it just a isn't it just a straight max? Don't you just multiply it to yeah. get from from pretest to uh, post test? And the reason why there's that table is because what you need to do is you need to change your pretest probability to odds first. Mm -hmm. You need to multiply those odds by your likelihood ratio. And then after that, you need to change that back into a, into a post-test uh, probability. That's actually so quite, that's, it's quite confusing though, isn't it? Oh, very confusing. It's Absolutely. not making intuitive sense to me, which is a bit annoying, but so, I mean, just, just roughly looking at this in that example, say 25% you know, prevalence of something yep. uh, and then say the likelihood ratio is three. And if yes. I, I kind of intersect that graph, it yes. roughly comes to 50 something percent. It comes to probably around, yeah, around 40, I would say 40, 30, between 30, 30, uh, 30 to 40. Yeah. Nah, nah, definitely, definitely going up to the, definitely going up to 40 to 50. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, 50 maybe, maybe 40 to 50. Maybe 50 to 60 is going up to look at this. Oh, you know what? You know what? You are absolutely right. I've I've actually um, I'm actually transcribing it wrongly onto my my computer. So yes, 25 across the three would head up to about 40 to 50. So yes, you are right. So now now that uh, I can see that uh, with the line that uh, yeah, that needs to be drawn, that mm. would change it to to 40 to 50 percent. So you can see that that mm. the likelihood ratio of three doesn't actually increase your probability by three times. It mm -hmm. probably just it, it doubles it because what it's doing is that it's just changing the odds mm -hmm. all right and that's and that's what Bayes theorem uh discusses so Bayes theorem this says that your pretest odds multiplied by your likelihood ratio equals your post-test odds mm -hmm. and that becomes dependent on prevalence and that's where you introduce the idea of uh prevalence to this answer mm -hmm. so as we said, uh, a likelihood ratio of three does not increase your probability by a factor of three, and it's described by the um, by the Bayes uh, nomogram. So um, th there's a formula out there for uh, Bayes theorem, and and uh, when you sort of uh, um, sort of break it down, and we we're not we're, we don't need to go through it on this podcast, but um, there when you sort of define what um, odds are in terms of probability the formula that you'll get that you'll see is that your post-test probability equals your prevalence multiplied by your sensitivity divided by, and this is all in brackets, one minus prevalence multiplied by one minus specificity plus the prevalence multiplied by your sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's your post-test probability. So what, what's happening there is that I've converted your pre-test odds multiplied by the likelihood ratio to post-test odds. And I've converted that post-test odds into post-test probability. And when you think about that, um, that's the, that's the formula there from, from mm -hmm. using, using the idea of prevalence, sensitivity, and specificity. And again, obviously it's, it's, it's difficult to conceptualize without very difficult to conceptualize. I will definitely put these in the story notes to just assist people to kind of follow along as well. Yeah. Now, now, now you'll see different iterations of Bayes theorem. So if you look at Bayes theorem in terms of uh, statistics, you'll see this idea where, where they go, the probability of A happening um, given the occurrence of B equals the probability of B happening um, given that A has a given um, the presence of A multiplied by the probability of A happening divided by the probability of B happening. Okay, so that's the formula there, which is um, the actual description of Bayes theorem itself. But I can tell you that I've I've done the um, the the workings out, and they they equal the same as as what I've described previously on on that previous formula, which is your post test probability equals your prevalence multiplied by your sensitivity divided by in brackets one minus prevalence multiplied by one minus specificity um, plus the prevalence multiplied by sensitivity. 
Okay. Now, La, this is gonna this is gonna blow your mind. This will blow your mind. Okay. Can't wait. <laughs> now, that that formula is complex. Yeah. Yes. Hayes theorem. Agree. Yes. Now, the thing that is really confusing is that when we think about Bayes' theorem, it has been said that post-test probability is, is your positive uh, predictive value. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where this confusion comes from, okay? okay. Is that we know that your, um, your positive predictive value is your true positives divided by your true positives plus your false positives because you're looking at the test itself. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, when you look at a two by two contingency table, if you're able to get prevalence, so if you have a large enough sample where, where what is what the numbers are representing on the two by two contingency table represents the actual prevalence of the disease, mm -hmm. if that is the case, then Bayes' theorem will equal your positive predictive value. Okay. It is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so even though you've got this really complex formula, yes. if, it, if it so happens that the table or the numbers that you have provided mm -hmm. is a true reflection of, of what is happening in the community, mm -hmm. so the prevalence that you have is actually a true reflection, then in itself, Bayes theorem is the same as positive predictive value. So you don't, so you don't need to do, you don't need to your prevalence multiplied by sensitivity divided by one minus prevalence multiplied by one minus specificity plus prevalence times sensitivity. You can just say Bayes theorem equals your positive predictive value and your positive predictive value equals your true positive divided by true positives plus <laughs> false positive. I was about to say, you know, it is all so complicated and I'm like, well, I don't use this in day-to-day -day life. You know, I no. look at a test and I yep. go, okay, that sounds fancy. And then I look at the positive predictive value and I go, is this test really going to work in a practical sense? And I love the fact that it came down to positive predictive value. You know, the real world application of any test really is your positive predictive value. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, if you've got low prevalence, you will have a really terrible positive predictive value. Um, and then often you'll see certain drug companies or te te test testing things have, uh, you know, referenced the one that sounds better. So, you know, if you've got a really low prevalence, your negative predictive value will be amazing. And so that's yes. that's quoted instead of the positive predictive value. Uh, La, you have, you have, you have nailed it. Absolutely nailed it with that comment. Okay. So I just going to reiterate, and I think that comment is so important. So if you have um, a disease such as difficult intubation, which, oh, sorry, yeah, difficult intubation, which has very low prevalence, your positive predictive value, as you correctly noted, is going to be low. It doesn't matter how good the test is, it's That's always right. low. Yeah. And so we can actually think about that um, through Bayes. And that's why, that's why we can sort of reverse engineer it and think about it through Bayes' theorem. Because remember that Bayes' theorem talks about your pretest odds multiplied by your likelihood ratio equals your post-test odds. Mm -hmm. So if your pretest odds are low mm -hmm. for difficult intubation, it doesn't really matter what your likelihood ratio is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if it's, you know, if, so if you've got, if you've got a, uh, incidence of difficult intubation of like, you know, 0.01%. Yeah. Which and is, your likelihood ratio is 10 or something amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, um, 20. Yes. It's only going to increase that from, you know, 0.01 to 0.1 to 0.2%. Your, yeah. your, your, sorry. And, and, I, and, I, and I say that um, as in, and I shouldn't have said that actually, because it, it's not, it's not, uh, it's, I shouldn't have used probability, but it, as in, as mm -hmm. in, I should, I should have used odds. So yeah. it's not, it's not a factor of that. So um, it just changes your odds. Mm. Um, by that factor, which actually, when you convert that to probability is actually a lot less. Exactly. And so it, it's interesting because when we talk about, so let's say, I think difficult airways is one of the things that really affects, uh, you know, our patient's lives and our planning and takes a lot of time and effort. So we do these tests. We know that the chance of difficult intubation is very low, but then we use these tests with, you know, various grades and Mel and Patty and thyroid mental distance. And we all know that they're just not very good at predicting things. And so I almost think, we, there, there, is a, there is a method of predicting airways that does always work. And it's a common sense method. The patient can't open their mouth, difficult intubation. Um, the patient has angst bond and can't flex their neck or is fixed flexion 90 degrees, difficult intubation. The patient has a massive tumor, difficult intubation. So really what I'm doing there is I'm using a scale, which is the common sense zero one scale. Zero is not present, badness. One is it is present. Therefore, the difficult intubation is obvious. As soon as yep. we get into the gray areas of 
you know, is this an unpre unpredicted difficult airway? That's when it just seems unsatisfying and we need to take all these other things into account that one number just can't really. That's right. So, so okay, it's interesting what you're doing, Lara. So what you're doing, Lara, is what, what you're saying is that now you're no longer saying what the prevalence of difficult intubation is in the general community. Yes. Now you're saying what the prevalence of difficult intubation is in someone with ankylosing spondylitis or the prevalence of difficult intubation in someone with limited mouth opening. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, and kind then of. where you're going from there is, is that you're saying that your, your pretest odds are a lot higher in those patients. Mm. And then what you do is you have some other tests that you might do. So let's say you've got someone with ankylosing spondylitis and then they've got a melon party four. Mm. Yeah. And then, so what happens then is that that, that will change your post-test odds. So your pre-test odds were pretty high already. And then having a, having a melon party four will go, Oh my goodness me, your post-test odds are, are even higher. You know, the reason I disagree with that is because you have someone with angst bond, you can flip a, you, you, you can literally just flip a coin or do anything. And the person, person's going to be like, regardless of the test I use, angst bond, severe angst bond equals difficult intubation, whether I'm reading some tea leaves, whether I go through a crystal ball, whether I ask someone to pick a random number out of a number generator. Look, I'll, but, I'll, but I'll, I'll tell you this scenario that if I had someone with angst bond, and yeah. they were they and looked like next, like oh no no, but the, yeah yeah okay look um but you no know, but no but what I'm saying is that uh, see now you're describing other features of angst spawn. Mm -hmm. so what I, what I'm saying is that if a patient has angst spon ankylizing spondylitis mm -hmm. and they have got a melon party one, mm -hmm. you know to me I would go look I I'd be pretty confident uh, that uh, they'd be okay but I I agree with you that if there was a patient with angst spawn and they've got fixed neck flexion. Mm. And they've got a melon party four and everything about them is, yeah. is um, just as in had adds addition in terms of the assessment of the airway is difficult. I'll, I'll say that they're absolutely difficult, but what, what I'm saying is that yeah. like having, having angst, ankylizing spondylitis does not, does not mean that uh, you're going to be difficult unless you've got other features that are associated with it. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And I think where I disagree is then I think there's certain things that will make it big, uh, difficult regardless. So in your example, severe 90 degree flexion ag spond yep. plus melon patty one, you're saying that. Oh no, but you're not, you're not going to get it. You're sorry, not going to get melon one with, uh, oh, no, no, with, as in, uh, severe neck, with fixed neck flexion. You, you know? you'd, even, you'd even argue that, you know, what, what is melon patty? Once you have a fixed neck, it's not even a melon patty anymore, you know? But I'm, I'm going to say that regardless of what any test you might do, it's so abnormal, therefore it will be difficult regardless. Now, there's gray, like, the, you know, the, there's gray areas. Maybe the angst one isn't as severe, maybe Correct. the tumor yeah. isn't as severe. That's right. And, and then again, any one test, it just fails to take into account the multiple, you know, anat anatomical things that need to go correctly for an airway to be managed. Because, uh, and I think you may, you may, you've made my point, which is that uh, it depends on the severity of disease. Yep. Because yeah. I've certainly managed and spawn uh, uh, spawn patients where I've gone, you're not going to be difficult at all, yes. and I and I haven't gone further than than that other than looking at them and they've gone. I've got a history of ankylizing spondylitis and they've just gone, mm -hmm. you know, moving that melon party one. I'm going okay, even yeah. though you've got a history of ankylizing spondylitis, mm -hmm. because I've done all the airway assessment, yes, and your and this were your pretest odds. Um, your likelihood ratio has has now reduced, yeah. and your post test odds are going to be low. Mm -hmm. I'm and comfortable it's, that it's even though you've got a, even though you've got high pretest odds, that you still may have a difficult airway. It's probably going to be lower. Yes. So I, I agree with you in terms of it depends on the severity of of disease, and I think that that in itself is part of that assessment that you make. So maybe, maybe my 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 summary is, if you have just obvious to everyone in the room badness then you don't have to do anything. It's, it's so obviously bad that this is going to be a difficult airway. And then everything else, you really, that's, that's why they've kind of changed to, a, you know, the, the, you're looking at the three, three models, uh, the, or the three axes of intubation or the you know, different um, anatomical models of the you know, anterior to posterior of the, of the airway. And looking at it logically whilst combining tests, you can get an overall picture of it. And hopefully you can, you know, pick up something that's really significant. Like the mountain padding might be one, but hold on, thyromental distance is three centimeters, so that's that's terrible. Uh, and you can you kind of pick up on these things. What what's yeah. your what's your utility? Do you do, you do a balance party assessment routinely on your patients? 
Look, I, I do. Actually, no, I don't actually. I don't. Yeah. I, um, because I know that the positive predictive value is low. And as, uh, yeah, so my, I, I, do, I do an assessment and I get my trainees to do assessment because I think it's important that they know the language that we speak and that they have a think about the airway because it forces you to think about the airway. But mathematically, any of these tests aren't actually that useful in predicting something, but they provide a framework that you can think about things really usefully. And they do like say, you know, I will always check mouth opening because if that is, you know, that is bad, then you can't, you know, you can't put a laryngoscope in or put an LMA down. Yes. But ultimately uh, I probably, I probably don't on everyone uh, because I know that airways are almost always easy once you get to an experience level and then obvious things I definitely check for. So I'm, I'm not being complacent. If I, if I'm worried about anything, I do do some standard checks to make sure. Yep. Oh, I, I a hundred percent agree. And uh, mm. for that very reason, I don't routinely do a melon party assessment, but I will do a melon party assessment in someone who I'm concerned may potentially have a difficult intubation because I think it compounds that. So yes, I will yes. do a melon party assessment in someone with an ankylosing spondylitis, someone with um, morbid obesity. Mm. And I must say, like, like having having a having a patient with a melon party one who's morbidly obese, mm. I feel a lot more comfortable than yeah, uh, right. you know that, that you know that patient with. The sh they, they, they've got the short neck, they've got yeah. the shoulders, and then they're, and they're opening up their tongue, <laughs> and you're going. I think the typical scenario is someone who's genetically big. You know, say like the usual situation. Island, the person is often you know very large in terms of kilograms, but all the features are large simultaneously. So math opening is fantastic, melon patty is fantastic, and it's a good it's an easy airway. Yep. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you get someone and the BMI is large and something else is going, it, it's funny because I think we, it's not like we've studied this together. It's just what we've come through, through kind of over a decade of experience that this That's is right. how we both practice in a very similar way, which is quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had a patient yesterday um, with, who was uh, morbidly obese and a beard um, going for a uh, knee arthroscopy. And mm. so I, I looked at him and I, and you know, my assistant was, okay, this guy's going to be, he's going to be a tricky airway. Mm. And then uh, I thought, look, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try to get away with a supraglottic device. No, get away. That's, that's the wrong phrase. Well, I know, I know. <laughs> I thought quick case, hopefully he'll be able to manage with a supraglottic device and um, <laughs> worst comes to worst that uh, I may, you know, and I, ne I never like, I, this is one of my um, personal preferences. I never like instituting, instituting positive pressure ventilation through a supraglottic device. I think that when you need to do that, it's, it's imperfect. And, um, you do and, check it though. When you first put it in, you check that it works. The supraglottic device. Yep. Check supraglottic goes in. Check. Uh, okay. So, so my technique for these, a lot should, of these should patients, we pause, should we pause the recording or no, I think this is great for everyone to hear. I think they want to hear this. Um, and look, we're, we're digressing from part one and, you know, <laughs> from the primary exam, that's all right. But I think it's useful. Um, so what my technique for these patients is that I always have them spawn venting. Mm -hmm. So I don't use opioids on the induction. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll use a co-induction technique of um, propofol and sevoflurane. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that when I do put in the superglock device, mm -hmm. they should commence uh, ventilation themselves. And, and I've got to say, this is good because um, yeah, it's, it's good to see the different range of practice. I would, I would never do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and, yeah, yeah, and the reason I do that is I'll, yeah. I just want to see how they, how they manage uh -huh. um, just spontaneously ventilating on a, on a, on a, um, on a laryngeal mass. And how about like, do you lose anything by testing to see that you can get one breath of positive pressure ventilation? So it's hard for me, mm -hmm. my personal experience that it's hard to, to do it on these patients just because yeah. of the amount of weight, like yes, their, yes. their compliance, their chest wall compliance is so Exactly. Low. So they, essentially they've got a, like a restrictive chest wall defect. That's right. It's hard to positive pressure ventilate them anyway. Um, so you, you, you're, you're counting on the fact that you're very experienced. If things go wrong and you need to positive pressure ventilate, you can very rapidly transfer to paralysis tube if you need to. That's right. Um, so I, I think from, from a, like uh, maybe, uh, maybe the most cautious point of view or maybe... As a, from a trainee point of view, you put an LMA and you make sure it works in terms of positive pressure ventilation. Uh, but, but that's because, you, you know, well, it's you so hard. Like, I think, you know, especially with these patients here and look, I think positive pressure ventilation in someone like myself and, and, and you would mm -hmm. be fine because we don't have that 
uh, chest wall rigidity or, or reduction in chest wall compliance. Mm. But I know in these patients um, that po- trying to positive pressure ventilate them through a supplicate device is not going to work, which is, ex- which is funny enough, exactly what sort of happened was that um, yeah. he was actually doing, he was actually doing all right. So he was, <laughs> he was chucking away, um, maintaining his own uh, rest rates. Yeah. And, and so, and so, and, and that's why it happens potentially mentally because you're not, you're not fight you're not fighting against anything. It's in, mm. they're, they're creating all the respiratory efforts. So they're the ones that are creating the uh, negative uh, intrathoracic pressure. And yeah. you can, you can support that a little bit with, um, yeah. uh, with PSV pro. Although again, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant, reluctant <laughs> to uh, use the ventilator on these patients. And when I do, I always get, I always sort of head towards the, uh, Mm. That, that, that this patient needs to be tubed eventually. And so the patient was doing all right, but then my mistake was, this is where mm. my mistake was, uh, as in he was chugging away and then I decided to give him some, um, some IV oxycodone for, um, uh, for pain. Ventilation drops. <laughs> and I overdosed it because this guy had a history of being on, on Tarjan and Endone. So I thought, oh, look, you know, he's, he's 130 kilos. Um, he's probably got some tolerance to opioids. I'll just give him 10 of uh, IV oxycodone. Mm-mm. Uh, no idea. No, no idea. It was uh, too much for him. He came at Nick, and I've just gone. Oh, I've just burnt my bridge. So, um, so then, then, then you tubed him. Well, I, well, initially I moved on to the ventilator first to see mm. what would happen with um, uh, positive pressure ventilating, and as expected, you know, very hard to ventilate pressures of you know forty centimeters of water, and yeah. just you know low volumes of three hundred mils, and this is one hundred thirty kilogram. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm looking at all right, and I've just bit the bullet. All right, all right, fine. We're gonna we're gonna intubate him, and then because of the airway assessment prior, yeah, so you know that this guy, big guy, you know that his pretest odds are gonna be higher. I did an airway assessment, beard, melon mm. party four likelihood ratio was going to be higher. His post that odds were therefore increase. Mm-hmm. I knew straight away that this guy was going to be difficult. So yeah. um, had those things ready. I said, look, you know, let's just go straight to the video laryngoscopy and let's just use a flexi tip bougie yeah. and had everything prepared. So yeah. that, and, and this is where it helps. Um, knowing, knowing how these tests can, can influence your, your pre-test odds or what you, what you think the prevalence is, because if I, if I had done a, an assessment and he had a melon party one um, and he didn't have a beard, mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't have gone straight for the video laryngoscopy. I would have gone, look, I, I should be able to intubate him uh, mm-hmm. fairly easily just with a, a normal uh, laryngeal blade and, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, tube. Yeah. It's funny how yeah, the whole time we're thinking, I mean, we think about odds the whole time we're just you know, in life and medicine, whatever. And this does provide an interesting framework for that to, to occur. Um, yep. that's, a, that's a really interesting case. Yeah, I, I love hearing this because it's, especially when it's different to you know the other practice that I've seen, and I think it, I think it's being great to know what is possible as well as how you manage these things and how you anticipate and plan you know things when they do go wrong because you already had the assessment done that you knew we were going to convert. Regardless of the fact that I would have just put a tube in at the start and say you know just a- <laughs> oh yeah absolutely and and look I think. Uh, you know, in many ways that, uh, and, and, and I think sometimes, you know, you create a rod for your own back with the successes that you've had in the past, if, if that makes that's, any that's, sense. That's true. That's true. Because, uh, you know, there's, there's probably a couple of times where I've, um, and I, and, and you're right, using the word get, you know, uh, getting away with, uh, things that they do. Don't, don't use that in the final exam. You never get, a, I think you can get away with it. Because it's not you getting away. It's your patient um, that has to live with Being you. able to <laughs> use a superglottic device in these patients. So being able to use a superglottic device in these patients successfully, uh, in the past, yeah. um, you know, and, and it's so, it's just a lot easier to just avoid the use of muscle relaxation and then having to, uh, extubate them after. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think, uh, in some ways the ease of that has that benefit in why, you know, if I can, and if, if, um, if it's allowed, I will try to actually use a superglottic, superglottic device in these patients. And I, look, I don't think I'm the only one mm-hmm. because I think, um, if you, if you look at a lot of patients who are morbidly obese, I think people, or at least our peers, I think probably about half of them would, would, uh, would something try a superglottic I don't device? I, I used to have a cutoff for the weight that I would not use a superglottic in. I, I, I don't have that cutoff anymore. Yeah. And I think the only difference is I, I just make sure that I can positive pressure ventilate even yeah. with the LMA. And if I can't, I go through my, my pathways. I'll try the LMA. If I can't positive pressure ventilate so I can get myself out of trouble in the odd instance of apnea or a surgeon needs something done or whatever it is, 
then I'll choose straight away and, to go intubation. And when you say you, you, you know, you want, you can positive pressure ventilate, like what do you mean? Like uh, yes. you got so, like so, volumes or a compliance uh, that you think about? Well, exactly. Yeah. So I'll do my, uh, the appropriate induction for this patient with propofol and fentanyl um, and, you know, check their sleep. So are they asleep? Are they deep? Put the LMA down, make sure that I can bag mask on low flows. And if that is all good, then I go. I, I continue so, the case on that. Yeah. So in this 130 kilogram patient, if you could get 400 mils in oh, with, with, a... with 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 not excessive pressure. So if I'm going to 15 to 20 maximum 20, but 15 centimeters yeah. water to get reasonable tidal volumes. Yeah. I'm happy if I'm not going to get that. Um, and there's plenty of times I've had patients with you know who are into the 150 kilos who are actually easy to ventilate because the deposition of their mass and their lung compliance has been okay in the correct position yep because i had this 150k person for an ect yep, here we go so so you have so you have used supraglottic devices in uh, in these patients the only thing i disagreed with was i always check i can positive pressure ventilate oh right okay well i i i, I mean for me that because i have them spot venting as in it's not a um uh it's not, not a requirement for me because my my requirement is that they're able to spot vent uh effectively yeah. on on um on these superglottic devices yeah so i will have them spot venting yeah. like i'll but i just want to make sure i've got the backup of positive pressure ventilation which is then really just a, a risk profile thing you know yeah. in that situation you're like okay I, I can i can tube this i'll go straight to the tube if, if i have problems yeah, but yeah. I, I think this... there's. I think there's actually a correlation. I think there's a correlation between the ability to spot vent on a, um, on a superglide device and also your ability to positive pressure ventilate them through it yeah. as well. I think yeah. there's there's a there's a really good correl. I think there is a really good correlation actually. There, there probably is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we've gone probably for a long period of time on the, on, on this. Um, uh, is there okay, well, and it's oh yeah. So I'll quickly mention about um, receiver operating curves, which yeah, uh, the examiner sort of uh, mentioned. So these receiver operating characteristic curves, what they do is they plot um, sensitivity versus one minus specificity, or in other words, um, your true positive rate versus your false positive rate. And what it's saying is that um, because the thing is with the tests, and and you you do this for continuous variables. So with a melon party score, you know, you got one, you got one, two, three, four. It's not, it's not a true continuous variable. Um, you know, the, I think the, the, the better examples are things like um, lactate or urea as mm. a, and, and then you see where the cutoff lies for a certain outcome you're looking at. So either uh, mortality or a, a morbidity that uh, you are um, mm. trying to look at. And what you want to see is at that cutoff where that sensitivity and specificity lies because there's always going to be a trade-off between them both okay mm. very 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 rare i mean the perfect test so the perfect test will will have a hundred percent sensitivity and it doesn't matter where you change the numbers right it will always be a hundred percent sensitivity so you can change the numbers in order in order so that your specificity is also high as well okay and and that will be called the perfect test with a um and when you draw when you draw your receive operating characteristic curve, it it you know it, there's there's that straight line across forty five mm -hmm. degrees. What it look like? It was look like a perfect look like a perfect right angle triangle. Okay, mm -hmm. and so the area on the curve is a perfect one. But that's not always the case. You always see like a little curve shape. And the closer to one you are, mm -hmm. um, the better the test is. All right. And then the closer to the horizontal line, which means that if your um, test of your continuous variable sits on the 45 degree line, it means that the area under the curve is half. It means that the test is random, mm. all right? So it, it assesses the diagnostic accuracy of a test and then describes the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity for a continuous variable. And look, it's useful when you wanna um, compare different tests. So let's say you've got um, a melon party score and next circumference. Mm -hmm. So you you can plot you can plot those two receiving operating characteristic curves, and then when you see how the numbers change with regards to sensitivity and specificity for um, as you increase uh, the variable, you want to look at the area under the curve for both characteristics and the 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 parameter which has the higher which has the higher area under the curve <coughs> will have the higher diagnostic accuracy. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and so for me, I think next conference is actually a lot more, mm-hmm. um, has probably has more accuracy than Mountain Party scores. Yeah, I've seen, some, I've seen some evidence on that, how it's, uh, yeah, like is it greater than 44 centimeters is a decent increased risk of a uh, difficult intubation and greater yes. than 60 is a lot. Definitely, or, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's really interesting. And it would be interesting to actually see the uh, plots of Mel and Paddy or even Nexon Conference on a receiver operated characteristic curve. That would be yeah. interesting to see. You know, you know those numbers, 44 and, and uh, 60, 60 bit. And that, a bit. You, know, you know what they remind me of? They remind me of the, um, of the ages uh, of FRC and closing capacity. Don't yeah, think? I, think, I think I've just made up the numbers. For, <laughs> no, I think you're right, though. No, it's, oh, it's 42. I think it's 42. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's around 40. I know it's definitely around 40 is when you start worrying. And, and when you go above 60, it's, uh-huh. uh, it, it's got a very, very high um, correlation with uh, being difficult. Actually, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get some data on this. So I've got the got the study up right away. Uh, neck circumference 42 centimeters. So neck circumference neck circumference greater yep. than 42 centimeters predicts difficult airway. Yes. And the reference for that number 15 is uh, Millet Athanasa glue airway management in obesity, and that's in topics in core topics in anesthesia and perioperative care of the morbidly obese surgical patient there you go yeah yeah but but i do remember i do remember in my notes somewhere i've got 60 as well so i, I think that there, there probably is another article out there which references above above 60 centimeters water and how that's um i'm gonna get that for you too that increases yeah. your diagnostic accuracy even more here we go increased incidence greater than 60 centimeters yep oh and and this reference is someone's notes actually but referenced, there are references in this person's notes, quite a few of them. They do actually mention 44 centimeters and 60 centimeters. Yes. In fact, greater than 60 centimeters is a 35% risk of difficult airway. Those sound, those sound like my notes, La, but uh... they're, they're, they're not your notes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure your notes were fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, uh, should we close there That's yes great. absolutely <laughs> how interesting what, what a great what a great topic to talk on i do i do like going clinical visits you know i feel like it's way, way more relevant <laughs> but anyway. so thanks very much for listening and watching please share with anyone who might be interested and thanks to all our patrons for donating we really hope that we can get to an amount where we can support fund a fellow and just remember even if it's just a dollar or even five dollars a month that's fantastic we really appreciate that and five dollars is just a cup of coffee Uh, So please support us um, and we'll put the links down below. Thanks so much for watching and listening. See you next time.